Hello, everyone. So glad you could join us today. I'm your host, Ian Gowiner. I'm the founding artistic director of the Chesapeake Shakespeare Company in Baltimore, Maryland. And today, as our guest, we're delighted to have Matthew R. Wilson uh, as our guest. Hi, Matt. How are you? Doing great. How are you? I'm, I'm okay. I'm okay. Matt is a two-time Helen Hayes Award uh, winner and seven times nominee as a director, as an actor, playwright, and fight director. He's also a published scholar, currently writing a book on Commedia dell'arte, which I think I'm pronouncing incorrectly. Is it Commedia dell'arte? That's Commedia very good. For the Rutless, Rutledge Press. Is it Rutledge Press? <laughs> it is Rutledge. <laughs> I'm just going to ask you about every word if I'm pronouncing it right. Anyway. Great. So far, so good. <laughs> he's the founder of DC's award-winning Faction of Fools Theater Company. And uh, he, his work has been seen around the world, including in New York City and locally here at the Folger Theater uh, at our Shakespeare, uh, Chesapeake Shakespeare Company at the Kennedy Center and Shenandoah Summer Music Theater. And, and TV's House of Cards. So Matt Wilson as seen on TV. <laughs> and uh, Matt held an MFA from the Shakespeare Theater Company's Academy of Classical Acting and a PhD. So he's a smart guy. He's got a PhD from the University of Maryland. And he serves on the theater faculty at the George Washington University's Corcoran School of the Arts and Design. Matt, we're so glad you're here today. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you. So we're going to talk about uh, Shakespeare, and we're going to talk about Comedia, because, you know, you're a particular expert on that, and, uh, and, and comedy, and what it is to be funny on stage, or try to be funny on stage, and the perils of that. Uh, but first, I'd like to ask you about sort of your beginnings. When was the, when was the first time you sort of found performance or performed or saw something that was performed that was exciting? What was your first sort of connection to the performing arts? That's a, um, yeah. Um, my third grade teacher, a woman named Rachel Simmons, uh, was a fabulous teacher and was also a storyteller. And she would travel around and, and tell stories on the circuit in, um, in Tennessee where I grew up. And so she had storytelling woven through all of the curriculum that we were doing that year. She was always reading us stories, telling us stories, having us write our own stories, having us tell uh, other people, other stories, traditional stories, new stories, um, basically anything, anything we ever studied, it was, it was packaged in, in that. And so that's, um, you know, whether it's, uh, in my performance life or, um, in my, in my life as a historian, things that I've been interested in and studied from uh, the classics, literature, history, uh, it all, for me, coheres in a way in, in the world of stories, how we live story their lives. So th your third grade teacher, have you, are you still in touch with Rachel? Uh, I haven't talked to, uh, I haven't talked to, to Mrs. Simmons, that's how I knew her. She probably told me to call her Rachel last time we talked. I, I have, uh, in my adult life, reached out with her and, and talked to her some more and thanked her some more, but it's been a couple of years. Good, good. I think it's so important to let the people know that, you know, we had such a big influence on our lives and careers, let them yeah. know, and can, don't you? Absolutely, yeah. I'll hunt her down and tell her to watch this. <laughs> so this was in Tennessee, and you're in third grade, and then then there there's obviously some journey between... Um, between uh, third grade storytelling and uh, teaching acting at, uh, at George Washington University. So tell us a little bit about that journey. How did you get started after, after the storytelling piece? What, what, where did your journey take you kind of after that? Yeah, some journey. I had, I had more hair in third grade. Um, <laughs> But but a lot of things have stayed the same. I um, so so early on when I was eight or nine, I I started doing these storytelling events, going to uh, conferences. Uh, you know, I would always tell stories at like the the local library or things like that. I, I got on the public access television in fourth or fifth grade, 
nice. telling, telling some stories. And that dovetailed really easily into doing school plays or, or community theater plays. So um, Peter came later, but, but soon thereafter. One of the really defining things um, for me was when I was in ninth grade, we were able to go to the Tennessee Performing Arts Center and see um, the, uh, I think they were called uh, Tennessee Repertory Theater at the time, they're now Nashville Rep, did a production of Twelfth Night there. And this is, this is in a fairly big space, you know, 2,000 seats. Uh, Roadhouse and sitting there as, an, as a 14 year old, I'd never seen live Shakespeare before. And this production of Twelfth Night was just, just absolutely hilarious. You know, the garden scene, they, they are, are running around, uh, uh, spying on Malvolio behind the trees and everything. And I, and I had just never seen anything like it, never heard anything like it that, that I thought was so, um, so smart, but also so stupid all at the same time. And um, <laughs> to sit there with, with 2,000 other high schoolers and laugh at this uh, play from hundreds of years ago, I, I said, okay, I'm, I'm into this. I want to do this sort of thing. And the actor who played Festy, I was um, just so captivated by what he was doing. I said, I want to, that, that, that's the kind of performer I want to be. And um, and kind of the one thing I had going for me was to realize that I couldn't do most of what he could. So I, I really quickly went, okay, I've got to, I've got to learn a lot if I ever want to try to, to do something like that. So I'm going to learn how to juggle and tumble and play guitar. And, um, and there's really a direct line from seeing that show to the first time that I went to Italy to study Comedia dell'arte was I said, someday I want to play Festi. And I want more and more training in how to do classical comedy and physical comedy so that I can, I can play Festi someday. Uh, as it happens, I have still never played Festi. Oh, is that I've, right? I've played, I haven't. I've played Sir Andrew and I've played Malvolio. So someday, someday, maybe uh, Festi. But, uh, but that original goal has now led to uh, Comedia sort of became a thing of its own and just snowballed for me. And I went from spending six months studying it to coming back uh, to teach it uh, every year to starting to research it historically and, and write about it and, and make a lot of plays based on it. So, so Comedia has become its own, its own love for me. Um, even, even though I'm still, still waiting for my festi. <laughs> so, so tell me, cause I, I, I think I know what Comedia is, but I'm, as with my, much, m many things, I'm probably mistaken. Um, so help us out with exactly what Comedia, Comedia dell'arte is. Yeah, so Comedia dell'arte is something, I think it's, it is so present and still around us in the world that almost anybody, you know, if you, if you the newest Batman movie, has a character named Harley Quinn. <laughs> and Harley Quinn yeah. is a direct descendant from this Comedia character, Arlecchino, or the Harlequin. So it's kind of everywhere. Picasso was painting these things. You have these um, romance novels called the Harlequin Romance. You have you know, Pulcinella's Pizzeria or something like that. Um, it's, it's been so influential on us and, and it's still kind of hanging around so much that, that it's easy to ignore or forget or not take notice that, oh, all of these things that um, seem to be just taken for granted parts of culture are actually the work of individual actors who once upon a time said, you know, there was an actor who said, I'm going to play a character named Garlicchino and jump forward 500 years. And this notion of an Arlecchino or a Harlequin is, is so big that, that it's even in our most recent superhero movies. Um, so when we look at, back at the history of Comedia dell'arte, we're starting in the middle of the 16th century uh, on the Italian peninsula, but very quickly it's going to spread, um, especially in Paris, where it really takes root, but then to England, to, to Northern Europe, all the way to Moscow. Um, it gets on a boat and comes to, comes to the New World. In, in North and South America by the 18th century, but for about 200 years, from, a, from about 1550 to about 1750, Comedia dell'arte is, is the most dominant theatrical form throughout Europe. It's, it's something that, that just about anybody who has seen live performance on the continent is going to recognize this kind of Italian theater that was, was spreading all around. And so, um, 
Today, when we look at it as a style coming out of this movement, then we're going to recognize stock characters like boss characters and servant characters um, or, or employees. Anytime you see the, the, the sitcom trope or the movie trope of the greedy old boss and the, the kind of bumbling uh, employee, that's, that's something that, that Comedia Duarte made famous, that relationship. Um, Anytime we see relationships between parents who don't understand and kids who just just don't get it, that's something that Comedia Duarte made famous. If we see a comedy that involves a wedding, that's something that, that Comedia Duarte made famous. Uh, people running around and hitting each other with sticks and falling down and <laughs> and uh, you know making a lot of fart and, and butt jokes, that's all stuff that Comedia Duarte made famous. And, and Shakespeare would have seen these Comedia Duarte pieces, right? Yes, um, we know that Comedia dell'arte companies were touring uh, around England when Shakespeare was a kid, starting that early. We know that there were Comedia dell'arte companies in London, um, even performing for Queen Elizabeth during Shakespeare's lifetime. Uh, so we know it was around. We know he, he almost certainly would have seen it. The real smoking gun hmm. to me is in the Seven Ages of Man speech from uh, from As You Like It, where all the world's a stage mm -hmm. and, and all the men and women are merely players. And then Jaquees goes on and says they're, they're acts being seven ages. And he describes being a human being as, as being a kid and being a, as going to school and being young and in love and being a soldier and on and on until, uh, until the last age is, uh, is, is nothingness. Within that speech, several of the types that he mentions can be linked to Comedia dell'arte. The soldier is, is famous com from Comedia dell'arte. The lover is famous from Comedia dell'arte. Uh, but most obviously, when he describes being uh, an, an elderly person, he describes that sort of comedically as the lean and slippered pantaloon. Yeah, yeah. And, and that term, pantaloon, is a direct reference to the pantalone character from Comedia dell'arte. So undoubtedly, he's familiar with Comedia dell'arte. And he believes that his audience is going to be familiar enough with Comedia dell'arte that they'll get the joke when he says a lean and slippered pantaloon. They'll recognize the word. Yeah. yeah. So help, help, help me draw, a, uh, connect the dots. Because uh, I'm thinking there's an, er, there's a, in the Roman comedies, they're, they have a certain similarity to Comedia. Um, scripts, although they're not really scripts, are they? They're they're outlines, they're, right? Outlines, scenarios. They yeah. didn't write down the full script the way Shakespeare would have. Right. So, so there, so there are these Roman plays, and then there's these Commedia scenarios or scenarios, and then, and then you get to Shakespeare, and he's borrowing a lot of stuff from the Commedia. Uh, uh, scenarios but i am thinking that even in, in one of the in one of the plotus plays there are characters with the same names exact same names as characters in taming of the shrew i think grumio right and uh, maybe hortensia or something so anyway there's a couple of them yeah there. so what's the how, how do we get from one thing to another and i guess what do they all have in common yeah it's always dangerous historically to try to map out a simple this led to this led to this because sure. we know right we know that everything that happens happens for a lot of reasons not just for one reason um but but what we see the comedy actors doing as well as shakespeare doing everybody during that time is really fascinated with um, the same sorts of things i'm fascinated with which is how can we look back at at um, great things that happened in the past big ideas um stunning works of beauty that another human being before us has articulated. How can we look at that and be inspired by that to make something today? So um, it, this gives me an opportunity to talk about my, my background that my hands keep disappearing into. It's like, I feel like a, like a not very good weather person right now. <laughs> storm front moving across. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, Currently, physically, right now, sequestered in Washington, D.C., where I live. Uh, but virtually, right now, this background that I'm disappearing into, this is a building that you can still go visit. 
in a northern Italian town called Sabianetta, and this building is called Teatro Al Antica, the theater in the style of the ancients. And I have a, I have a couple of others here. We can we take a quick tour around northern Italy. So now we're in Sabianetta. Now we're in Parma. This building was built in the early 1600s. Um, this one is uh, late 1500s. This one is also late 1500s. This is in Vicenza, and it's called Teatro Olimpico, the, the Olympic Theater. And these are the only three theater buildings um, that were built during the Renaissance and that, that are still existing today, and you can still go visit. So, so you can go see this thing. This, this was built in 1585, this one, Teatro Olimpico, because the people in the Olympic Academy, and that's basically like rich Renaissance guys with a lot of time on their hands. They, they get together, they make a club, and they say, we want to we really be Renaissance men. And so that means we want to understand Greco-Roman uh, theater concepts. And, and you can see it in the building, right? That we wanna, we're, we're obsessed with these kind of columns uh, from Greece and Rome. We're obsessed with this kind of statuary. Um, and they were also obsessed with, with the playwriting as well. So <laughs> they, they did what they thought they understood, which is they, they built this building so that they could do the Greek play Oedipus the King by Sophocles. That hilarious play. <laughs> that, that hilarious play. Yeah. Well, what I think is kind of hilarious about it is that <laughs> when Sophocles did that 2,000 years earlier, he was almost certainly just on a, on a hillside on a wooden stage. He didn't have a theater that looked anything like this. So they're trying to be historically accurate, but they're really reading a lot of their own conceptual into it right so they they build what turns out to be like a roman indoor theater uh, but they have this kind of renaissance perspective scenery in the background sophocles would have had this but it's but this is their enterprise in 1585 is to say let's let's build like they used to build let's perform like they used to perform and let's let's see what we can learn from them so this particular one the theater of the style of the ancients um this set you know so this is this is what they think a tragic set should look like it's it's very and um, uh, stately and, and imposing, you know, it's, it's very formal, and, and this is the kind of thing that has to do with, with kings and princes and gods. And this is the kind of thing that they thought uh, a comic set should look like. It's just a regular city where anybody could meet on the corner. And so you, you referenced Plautus. That's um, the Roman playwright. He would have written plays like that, just regular people who show up on a corner and and something wacky goes wrong with somebody's marriage or, or somebody's um, slave at the time in the Roman plays. Um, that's, that's the material that a funny thing that happened on the way to the forum is based on that musical. So uh, it, it's also something that the Commedia actors were very influenced by and that Shakespeare was very influenced by. Shakespeare was reading Plautus when he was in grammar school. The Commedia actors were reading Plautus uh, and then they're both trying to turn it into something that they can that they can make art out of for their own for their own society. Cool. So um, so, some of the some of the Shakespeare plays, uh, you know, are re they feel like they feel like commedia uh, pieces, although although certainly not all you know not all of them, but right. you know, like the some of the early plays, especially like Comedy of Errors and. Taming of the Shrew, and and even like uh, you know, I guess Two Gentlemen for, of Verona um, mm -hmm. ha have that kind of sense to them. Um, but so Shakespeare, but but his process was very different from the way that these Commedia artists created their plays. Can you talk a bit about that? Right. Um, yeah. So Commedia is getting going a few a couple generations before Shakespeare. Um, and so the Commedia actors are, I think, the first on the stage for really sculpting out what it is to be a professional theater maker in the modern world. They're the ones who are trying to, to navigate that first. Um, but they're not the only ones doing that on Europe. There are other people who are, who are drawing from medieval traditions of traveling bards, and there are other people who are reading Plautus and Seneca and, and um, engaging in their own practices to try to figure these things out. The, the Commedia model, from the beginning, they said we can make a certain amount of money at home, but we can make a lot more money if we can take this show on the road and find more audiences to play with. 
And so that's, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of the, the core of, of how and why they were making plays was we have to build this to travel. Which means like this building here, there was a Commedia dell'arte company in residence for a couple of years in this building. So we know that that happened, but it was still kind of an anomaly. It wasn't the norm. They would have traveled, they would have played in people's palaces, they would have played in, in random meeting halls, they would have played on temporary wooden stages in courtyards and piazzas or, or countrysides, wherever they have to play, uh, that's, that's what they're gonna do. Whereas you see the model that's happening in Paris and London, which are much bigger cities and have a uh, better audience base, the, the drive there in the early professional theater is, hey, let's build a building that people can come to and that that can be part of our identity. So, so that's one big difference is, are we, are we seeing theater as something that can happen anywhere and that can, that can go on the road, uh, which the English actors were doing that also, or are we seeing theaters uh, like in London where it's, let's build the theater, let's build the roads, let's build the curtain, let's build the globe and establish ourselves as, as a company there. Uh, which the Italian actors were trying to do as well, but that's 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 one of the big differences. And then another big difference that um, that results from from this first choice is are we going to make scripted plays that are about particular topics for particular audiences? So a play like um, you know Shakespeare's Henry the Fourth, uh, which you all did a fabulous uh, versions of last season. Um, you know, Henry IV is going to be really interesting and exciting to somebody in London, but it may not be as interesting or exciting to somebody in Paris or Moscow or Berlin, which are all, or Rome or, or Venice, which are all places the Commedia actors are going. So the Commedia actors are saying, we don't want to get tied down by particular local politics. We don't even want to get tied down by particular language. We want to create a kind of show that even if people don't understand what we're saying, they can still follow the physicality. Even if people don't know who King Henry was, they can still understand what a greedy old man is like, or uh, you know what somebody who's young and in love is like. So, so because of this need to take the show on the road, Commedia dell'arte is really based around improvisation, and how can we how can we create something that's that's universal and broad enough that it can play anywhere, and then in the course of playing, we can specify this is how the show is going to happen tonight. So if they're in a building, you know, if they show up in town and they have a building like this, then they'll say, this is, this is fabulous. This is a great place to play. We've got these windows, we've got these doors, and we can build all sorts of, uh, uh, you know, comic happenstance out of the windows and the doors. But then maybe from there, they move on to a town that doesn't have a theater building. And so they have to play in, in just a big meeting hall or maybe even outside. And so they're going to have to set up curtains or something to, to act like this is a door to peek in and out of the curtain. And they're gonna. That's gonna change the nature of the show. So you don't see. So you know, for us historically, the the hard part is we don't have something like Shakespeare's first folio. We mm -hmm. don't have a collection where somebody actually wrote down here's how the plays went because they never wrote them down. And if you can imagine, like if nobody ever wrote Hamlet down. <laughs> except just an outline of it and all we knew of it today was we have somebody's notes that says you know, act three scene one hamlet contemplates suicide and tells ophelia to go to a nunnery moving on and that's all we ever knew and nobody ever wrote down the way to be or not to be goes then we would probably never have heard of the name of william shakespeare yeah and that's that's where the commedia dell'arte actors are right now because they were immensely famous at the time but uh, we just don't have the record of, of exactly what they were doing. So let me let me talk to that to, to that point, um, uh, and it, let me start with a, maybe a little bit of a personal story, and then I want to ask your your reaction. So one of the things that originally um, connected me to Shakespeare because I was not a I didn't have that Twelfth Night experience at fourteen. I I you know I'd seen a little bit of Shakespeare. Um, but mostly by amateurs or, or you know uh, school productions and my connection to Shakespeare happened later on in life I had a you know I'd been in as an actor if you're a male actor and a stage actor in the United States you're eventually gonna be in some Shakespeare plays because there's a lot of them yeah. and a lot of parts so I'd done some I knew some studied a little bit but it was not a, a big thing for me um, and then 
uh, I was uh, in kind of early career director and I had the opportunity to, to direct um, Much Ado About Nothing. And I didn't really, I didn't know if I was, if I could do it. I didn't know if, you know, if it was something I could succeed with because of, you know, my real lack of background in Shakespeare. But then, then I watched, I watched the Much Ado, the Kenneth Branagh Much Ado About Nothing movie. A, a lot of people have seen this film. It was super famous about 25 years ago. Um, and when I watched the movie, I really liked the parts uh, with Kenneth Branagh and Emma Thompson who played Benedict and Beatrice. But then it got to the part with Dogberry and Michael Keaton. Yeah. If you remember Michael Keaton plays Dogberry and Ben Elton, who's also a very famous English comic actor, plays Virgis. And, and these are two really, really funny people. And Kenneth Branagh is, you know, he's, he's, you know, one of the most famous Shakespeare directors that we have alive. Right. And I went, oh, oh, they don't get it. They don't get what's funny about this. Mm. And I don't know, I, guess, I think one of the things I love to do most, and, and you know, Matt and I, we have professional experience together. Most recently, um, Matt is a really funny comic actor. And, uh, and uh, as a director, uh, one of the things I love to do is to help really, really funny people be just a little bit funnier if that's possible um and and i found that i found i found that um that interest but at that moment i watched that movie because there are things yeah there were things in the language of shakespeare that are jokes that that we don't really get anymore but then there's a lot of other comic stuff that we do get but not necessarily from the words on the page and there's like, there's like a, if you have an understanding of kind of, kind of comic traditions and, and what people, how, how comedy works with an audience, how it interacts, you can sort of figure those out. And that to me is the great joy in directing yeah. Shakespeare comedies, the funnier ones, is that is to find those to crack that code as much as you can, and and I I know that's that's a trick. Even it's a much harder trick with comedia uh, outlines or scenarios because you have even l l less. You have less information, um, and then I think of I think of the, the whole the, this process when if I kind of, well I was going to say contemporary. It's not really contemporary, but a modern. Uh, at least a 100-year-old uh, example, you know, it, it's as if in a Commedia script or in a Shakespeare script, there was, it, like if you were writing a, 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 a Marx Brothers movie, you know, and then you wrote about something that Harpo did, you know, uh -huh. like Harpo lifts his leg and, you know, and Chico holds on to his leg, and yeah. then Chico says something with an Italian accent that's a pun. Like, like it's, you know, it's almost, in, it would be indecipherable to us now, and it's 100 years later. And I, and I, there's something about that, I think, in, this, in Shakespeare comedy and yeah. as well. And, and, the, and the process of cracking that code, do you want to talk at all about, like, what that's like um, as an artist of, of you know, because... Look, all, all Shakespeare plays are comedies are not meant to be hilarious all the time. Right? This is just not. Mm -hmm. Some of them are, but but some of them are. Um, but certainly, there's stuff that's funny that you want still to be funny, or else rhythmically some of the plays don't work. So, so how do you do that? What's the process of that for you, as an actor, as a director, working in comedy or Shakespeare for that matter? Yeah. It it is maddening to look at some of the fragmentary notes that we have for these old uh, Commedia plays because we have maybe a page, maybe five pages of something that would have been a three-act play. And, and the part that was going to be the funniest, <laughs> all that they usually write is something like, they do night lots. <laughs> right. What, what does that even mean? 
And what it means is there was some sort of, you know, probably 15 minute long, just bit of physical hilarity from people in the night, in the dark, bumping into each other, confusing each other, you know, we don't know exactly, but, but all of the things that can go wrong and be funny in the, in the middle of the night, mm -hmm. that's going to be the showstopper for the act and that everybody's going to be talking about when they get home. All we have now a, a few hundred years later is they do night lotsy, which basically <laughs> means if we're going to try to re redo this play or learn from it, you know, what, what they're saying is insert something hilarious here. <laughs> right. <laughs> and you go okay thanks i i will do that where am i gonna find something hilarious but i think the thing that they were so good at was you know because it's not that comedia duarte is somehow uh, in the soul of all the humans i don't think it's part of this collective unconscious where where we've tapped into great truths of things i the, the way i think about it is these are these are just people who work very hard observing human nature and making fun of it. Mm -hmm. This is the labor of other artists that we have today. And, and by traveling around a lot, they were able to test over and over and over in front of lots of different people, is this gonna work tonight? Is this gonna get a laugh tonight? Because comedy is a, is a, is a binary situation, right? It's, it's you laughed or you didn't. Mm -hmm. There's no, there's no B plus for comedy. You can go see, you can go see a tragedy or a drama and walk out going, yeah, it was pretty good. Like you don't leave a drama going, I didn't cry. It wasn't good. <laughs> you can leave going, yeah, it was pretty good. Whereas a comedy, it's like, it was very funny or it was not very funny. And, and, and that's, there's something scientific to that. Something yeah. that it's testable. Let's try it. And if it works, we keep it. And if it doesn't, we don't. Yeah. So to be able to look at their cache of we've tried a lot of things and here are things we found to be funny and to add that you know, to our own guidance of where's the, you know, uh, French comic theorist Jacques Lecoq and, and Philippe Goulier talk about the jeu, the game. Like what's the game of this moment? How can I look at a situation and go, oh, that's, that's the game right there. Here's an example. So at Faction of Fools, we did a comedic version of Hamlet. And because uh, Hamlet's a very funny play. <laughs> and, and, we, and we made it um, even funnier, I, I think, I hope. Um, but it always for me starts with, like you're saying, with the text and with trying to get in and go, okay, what's really, how do I boil down what's happening? So that second scene where Claudius first comes out and he's making this huge speech about, this is the first time we, and he's got this public speech of, uh, here's, here's my family, here's my son, here's my wife, here's my relationship to the king that was dead, right? So we took that long bit of text and we kept all the text, but we said in our interpretation, what's essentially happening is he's trying to craft a family portrait. This is a situation where Claudius is trying to to present the new family image to everybody. Mm -hmm. So while he's making the speech, the way we stage it is a court, you know, like a court photographer there trying to capture these moments. And as he's talking, he's trying to get Hamlet and Gertrude into appropriate poses that say, look, we're the new royal family. And then things keep going wrong in the course of that, and they keep getting their pictures snapped at, at you know, really inopportune and embarrassing moments. Because we said that's the game of this speech, right? Is mm -hmm. is the family picture is the game. So that's where I like to start is to say, let's get into the text and the action and the characters, and then try to really boil down what is this moment about, and then how can that moment be? Fun? Yeah. Yeah. So let, let me talk, let me ask you a question about that, um, about about uh, stuff that is is not necessarily funny anymore. Um, I have a theory. I don't know. May, may may be an imperfect or completely wrong theory, but but you know, in in uh, in commedia and also in Shakespeare a lot, there's a lot of like references to beating servants. Yeah. And uh, contemporarily, I find that really hard to make those 
just mm -hmm. comic moments because I think in in our world it's funnier if the servant is beating the boss right, right. I think I think um, it's funnier when when Bill Murray you know is putting one over on whoever the character is in, that's in power in a Bill Murray movie um, rather than that than the you know the boss beating the servant um, so some of that well anyway that that's my dumb theory but 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 i want to i want to ask you uh, about uh, a a good example of that about taming of the shrew sure right which you know there's a whole there's a whole bit in taming of the shrew most of you have you know have some experience with it but 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 taming of the shrew it, you know, is it does exactly what you know, the title of the play says it to be. Now, contemporarily, we change it a bit because we have to because, you know, at face value, it's kind of intolerable a play. Um, yeah. But but there's some like there, there's an act four in that play where where Petruchio is like starving Kate and you know and and she's going through a lot of suffering. I get the sense that that was funny to Shakespeare's audience, but it's not so funny anymore. Right. So, right. so how do we, I guess, I guess the question I, I have for you is, is, you know, what is that decision-making process like for us as, as artists who deal with historical text or historical material yeah is, how much do we owe it to the material particularly in a comedy in this case how much do we owe to be true to that material and how much do we owe it to our modern audience to make it something that well or, or ourselves as artists to make it something that we believe in and that we want to further uh, these are these are great questions. I mean, these are these these are the the big and the crucial questions of now, right? And these we could talk for hours and hours about this because I don't think we I don't think we've cracked it. Yeah. The person to me who has who has hit this problem on the head the, the clearest and the best recently is Hannah Gadsby in in her comedy stand up Nanette. If you haven't seen Hannah Gadsby's Nanette. Uh, this should be required viewing in comic theory from here on out because she does a brilliant job of saying, isn't there something inherently mean about comedy? And, and what do we want to do today with the power structures and the cruelty behind it? And I think those are uh, such important questions. And for me, um, you know, kind of dovetailing into our historical conversation, there's a real danger in looking back at the past and valorizing it for having stuck around and been influential. Just because Shakespeare wrote The Taming of the Shrew doesn't mean that The, Sh the Taming of the Shrew speaks to universal truths that we want to uphold for all time, right? Um, even in thinking about Comedia dell'arte, a lot of the way people talk about Comedia dell'arte characters throughout the 20th century was, as I hinted at, this idea that um, that they're somehow in in the collective unconscious. That you that there is even to, to call the characters archetypes, which I've stopped doing. Uh, Scott McGahey uh, from Academia dell'arte convinced me to, to stop using the term archetype because if you say archetype then you're suggesting that there is this thing that, that is somewhere you know in the ether or in the mind or, or yeah. in the universe that exists it's, of it's, a servant type yeah it's young in to to misuse that phrase. Yeah. yeah and so the second you refer to a servant type whether you mean to or not you're affirming the notion that some people are born to be servants mm -hmm. That that's that that's who they are inherently by by themselves, um, and so I'm I'm looking at Comedia dell'arte these days not in terms of individual types but in terms of relationships. And somebody is a servant because there is a master, and it's in this relationship between servant and master that we get these power dynamics. And those power dynamics are not the way things have to be. They are a reflection of the way things are based on historical human choices. So I think one, one thing that we need to do is to not take at face value the claims about the way the world is that we see in a lot of 
these plays. But to zoom out a little bit more and, and say, okay, why is the world this way? And the thing that's really revolutionary about Commedia dell'arte in the early stuff is they are not out there saying there should be no masters and, and, and all the servants should, you know, let's, let's stick it to the man. Let's, let's put down the Duke and the church and everybody else. They, they don't have the luxury of doing that. They require the patronage and support of those people to do it. So they can't just say like the system's wrong, tear down the system. But what they can do is create these characters inside the system and let them have asides where they speak for themselves. So the servant has got to say to the master, yes, you're right all the time and I deserve this. But then the servant gets to turn to us and say, here's what it feels like to be stuck in this situation right now, in this relationship. And so I think where we can give voice to, to the people who are on the bottom ends of the power structures and where we can zoom out and look at the structures as something that are, that's created by a human system and not something that has to be or ought to be or should be. Yeah. Um, you know, comedy can be a powerful tool at that, of, of stepping back and making fun of the system yeah. and exposing the absurdity in the system. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's my mission as an artist is to show, show how absurd things can be. Um, <laughs> yeah. Just, yeah. Great, all right, that's, that's terrific. And I know we could talk about this for hours, um, but we're not going to be able to. But but your book is coming out. Um, when do you think? Uh, looks like next year. We've got a, some delays right now, uh, sure. COVID related. So I, I should be wrapped up with the research in the next few months. And do you have a title yet for the book? Uh, working title is Comedia dell'arte in history and performance. Great. And it's so a look question of of how people have viewed what Comedia dell'arte is and how. Uh, are we still defining what comedic art they is? Yeah, got it. Great. Well, look, we'll, everybody look for that book. I, I will read it for sure. Um, so before we go, we have we have a lightning round that we'd like to do. Oh, yeah. It's a lightning round of questions. Um, there are no rules to this. So here, I, I got them. I have to write them. Because it's so fast, I have to write them on a piece of paper. All right. All right. And I will okay. make myself ready to go? short answers. All right. Lightning round. Your least... Like your least liked Shakespeare play, Tammy the Shrew. Your favorite character on The Simpsons. <laughs> uh, it's got to be Bart. First musical you were in. First musical, Guys and Dolls. Kirk or Picard? Ooh, Picard. Why? I uh, I mean, that's the one that was on when I was growing up. <laughs> you know, I, I've always liked Kirk, but uh, but Jean Luc Picard is the one that I that I watched regularly on television. Greatest play ever written. King Lear. Most frivolous Shakespeare character. <laughs> I, I like Don Armado. Don Armado. <laughs> and uh, what's your superpower? If I could, if I could do anything, um, stopping time. Stopping time. Great. It's right. dangerous though, because I would I would do it all the time. I would never let time go on. I would still be like three years old. <laughs> so it would the, work against me. So what, what, I guess we got to come up with a name for that time stopping man. I don't know. Time stopping man. Yes, uh, all uh, procrastinator man probably. Procrastinator. <laughs> the future will never come. <laughs> Matt, thank you so much for taking time with us. I do appreciate it. And thank you. And best of luck, uh, and we'll, we'll talk soon. Thanks, Matt.